I am using the overall title Jesus and Rome for this series of sermons because I want to explore two often neglected items. One is the fact that Jesus challenged Roman rule in a nonviolent way. Two, the Gospel writers we call Mark and Luke fashioned an image of Jesus using Greco-Roman models. In this sermon, I want to explore the background of Luke's birth story in light of the writer's culture. I start by contrasting Luke's story with Matthew's. So, here's a translation of Matthew's birth story. You might guess that I'm particularly interested in the quotation from Isaiah. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. I put it in bold, after all. The word translated as virgin is Parthenos. And that word sounds familiar, despite my bad Greek. Think of this building in Athens. Now, since Matthew is quoting the prophet, it seems appropriate to turn to our Hebrew Bible lesson. In this passage, Isaiah is talking to Ahaz, the king of, in Jerusalem. The city is under siege. The prophet points to a young woman who is pregnant and announces that she is carrying a male child. Isaiah then predicts the downfall of the very kings sieging the city before the child is weaned. That's the point of the reference to eating curds and honey. That's the first food given to children. Um, babies, actually, in that culture. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated young woman is Alma. This word simply refers to a young woman of marriageable age, irregardless of her virginity. An ancient writer wanting to identify the young woman as a virgin would add the phrase who has never had sex. The phrase is not part of this passage for the very obvious reason that the young woman is already pregnant. So, if your Bible uses the word virgin at this point, it is wrong. And probably it's wrong because the translator is imposing an invalid Christian perception on the Hebrew Bible. When we turn back to Matthew, we find that he mangles verse 14 in several ways. Point out two. For one, he rips it out of its context so that it no longer points to events a short time in Ahaz's future, but several hundred years into a future Isaiah never imagined. Matthew also changes, second one, the tense of the verb. So instead of pointing to a young pregnant woman, Matthew points to a young woman who will become pregnant. Now, as to the word Matthew uses, it is a suitable Greek equivalent of Alma, in that it may refer to a young woman. It may also refer to a virgin. That is, Parthenos is ambivalent. So a translator may choose either virgin or young woman. The question is, which did Matthew have in mind? Let's leave that for a moment and turn to Luke. Luke tells a dramatic story. He has the angel Gabriel being sent out by God, flying over the Galilean countryside, swooping into the uh, town of Nazareth and fluttering to a stop in front of Mary. The angel presents her with a disturbing news. In my translation, I used young woman because by doing so, I emphasize that it is Mary who declares herself a virgin by responding to the angel, how can this be, 
since I have never had sex with a man. This removes the ambivalence from Parthenos. So, I think Luke considers Mary a virgin, and only Luke considers Mary a virgin. And the translators who use that word in Matthew are projecting Luke's perception back to the earlier gospel. Now that we know who said Mary was a virgin, it's reasonable to ask where Luke found that information. The answer is really very simple, in his own mind. Luke composed this story using elements from his Greek cultural tradition. Notice, unlike Matthew, Luke does not quote scripture. The reason he composed this piece is that his tradition told him that special people have special circumstances surrounding each stage in their lives. The particular special people that Luke had in mind were Roman emperors. The myths of Luke's time traced the lineage of the emperors back to the Trojan War hero Aeneas, whose human father, Archaeus, was seduced by the goddess Aphrodite. When the angel predicts that the Lord God will give to Jesus the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end, Luke makes a pointed contrast with Aeneas's line, which ended with the death of Nero several decades before Luke wrote. Hence, in Luke's mind, Jesus and his reign surpass Rome. Knowing how Luke composed his story, I suspect he would be very surprised to find his simple tale had been blown up into a convoluted dogma. And that leads me to think that if we reclaim Luke's lines of thought, we can realize the true power of his story.